I will um, talk about our latest uh, project, the Gene Family Information um, paper, where we look at variant interpretation and how we can use um, yeah, information of gene families to facilitate this um, interpretation. Um, so this paper has now um, been uh, submitted to the journal and is now in review. And um, but if you're already interested in this project, you can um, get the preprint of the paper at, in the bioarchive. There you can read about all the details. So today I will just give a brief overview of the project. So we started this project a couple of years ago with um, due to the notion that um, multiple genes we have recently discovered in um, epilepsy and neurodegenerative disorders, co um, um, exome sequencing studies, sound related to each other. And this is not specific to um, brain disorders, but um, many um, scientists have already noticed that um, genes associated with disease sound often similar. Like you can see here for, um, for example, this group of genes, which um, are all, for example, voltage gated sodium channel or subunits of those. And the reason why they sound similar is because they are related to each other. And we were thinking if this might be um, an information we can use um, to uh, facilitate our interpretation of uh, variants. So what are related genes? So genes um, which are related um, are belonging to the same gene family. And each member of those gene family genes is called the paralog. And paralogs, um, you um, have basically the same ancestral gene. And this is why they basically have often a similar-ish function um, to each other. Throughout this talk, I will only talk about gene families um, which are present in the human gene, for, uh, gene and in the human genome, and thus only about um, paralogs within humans. Why is this of interest? So, we, as I said before, um, genes which are related to each other might have a similar function. So we could consider um, looking at the protein sequence and look what kind of sites of the protein are still conserved, assuming that sites which are more functionally important should be conserved. This is a little bit um, different kind of approach and uh, not really uh, not much leveraged um, today, um, uh, especially not specifically. And what is more done traditionally is looking at uh, conservation across species. So uh, looking, for example, at this um, gene in humans, cow and mouse. So this, both um, types of conservation measurement are very different. So for example, if we look at a cross-species con um, conservation, for example, for this um, voltage-gated sodium channel gene, SM1A, for in human, mouse and cow, you see that basically all amino acids are conserved. However, if we um, look in um, databases um, of healthy individuals, we see that around about 400 of those amino acid positions in the human sequence are mutated in healthy individuals. This is a little bit surprising for us scientists because um, many of um, those, uh, many, many more variants in patients have been reported which have this very devastating disorder. And if everything would be, uh, which, which is conserved would be uh, pathogenic, then our observations from in healthy individuals um, are very surprising and cannot be true. So basically, many sites which um, in, the, in this protein cannot be um, essential in terms of function. Now, if we look at an alignment of, for example, within human um, paralogs of this voltage-gated sodium channel gene family from SM1, A2, A3A, and so on, you see here now the alignment, we see that many um, sites are not conserved in the family. For example, here we have like a whole desert where it's actually not conserved. However, we also find sites which are extremely conserved. The question is now, um, if the sites um, which are conserved um, are more functionally important or not, and if there would be a pattern, this would allow us to um, really uh, to increase power in gene discovery, but also to in, um, help us interpreting individual variants. This is quite interesting because around about 50% of all genes um, represent um, um, power looks, and this kind of um, framework could be used at scale. 
basically to empirically test uh, if basically um, power local offsets are important, um, we used a, um, a cohort of 10,000 um, trios where we had exome data um, and could uh, basically calculate or identify um, children which carry so, um, um, basically these so-called de novo variants. So variants which are present in the affected child, here's a distribution of the phenotypes, but are not present in the parents. Here we would assume that um, some fraction of these variants um, contributes very strongly to the disorder because the children have very, very severe disorders and would carry a variant which is very, very functional. So just some background information, how we usually would um, identify disease-associated um, genes in TRIO studies. We usually calculate um, basically uh, the number of de novo variants in a certain gene um, uh, per cohort, which we would expect. For example, here in 100 TRIOs, we would expect one de novo variant by chance. However, if we then see in our patient cohort for example, more than the number um, of the novel variants you would expect, you can calculate an enrichment um, p-value. And this model has been developed by Mark Daly and Kate Samoa like a couple of years ago, and basically assigns every gene a specific mutation rate. And very simplified, the larger the genus, the more mutations you would just uh, would expect by chance. However, um, uh, if we talk, for example, about the brain disorders, we know that they are clinically and, and genetically very heterogeneous. And to identify such a significant de novo burden, tens of thousands of um, trios are needed to um, get um, over the significance threshold, especially if we can uh, correct for multiple testing. However, what we can do is we can, for example, to perform like some kind of gene family enrichment framework, where we basically would count the number of de novo variants which we would expect for all the members of the gene family, and then count the numbers of de novo variants we actually see in um, our cohorts. And here we could leverage basically an aggregation across uh, multiple members of the gene family, which individually would not be significant. However, in combined, we see a significant enrichment, which we can test, for example. And as I told you before, in gene families, Around about 50% of all amino acids are not conserved or are conserved. And with this information, we can um, go in the enrichment even a step for, uh, the enrichment test even a step further and can also test whether the, the disease associated variants fall into paro conserved or non conserved sites. How do we do it? Basically, as you have seen before, we can score each position in a gene family member. Here is shown like this uh, putative gene family of three pyrologues. You can um, score each amino acid if it's either pyro conserved, so the sites are all identical at this position, or non conserved, basically the site is private and, and, and the member. And then we could basically, since we know which sites are conserved or not conserved, we can generate basically an in silico um, type of um, gene family, which the one is are conserved sites representing 50% of the uh, amino acids and one for non-conserved sites. And now we can actually test if we see in significant enrichment in this model or in the other one. If the de novo variants which cause disease are not randomly distributed, we should see um, significant enrichment in either one of those, which would really boost the power because we would um, expect many less variants just because of the size of the search space is much, much smaller. And this is actually what we did. And here now at the x-axis, you see the enrichment for gene families for the missense parallel conserved test. And you see that many gene families are enriched. However, if we perform the same test for the same gene families, um, but only considering and no variants at not parallel conserved sites, we don't see any significant gene families. Based on this simple empirical um, test, we can conclude that disease associated missense variants in gene family genes reside in parallel conserved sites, which has not been empirically shown to date. So now, since we're interested in discovering genes, um, 
associated in these trios. We can combine now um, the uh, parallel conserved missense variants with um, truncatings or loss of function variants in the same gene families, since many of these truncating variants are also associated with disease. Here we would look at the whole um, gene family, and for the parallel conserved sites, we would, on, we would reduce the search space to parallel conserved sites, which gives us more power. And in total, um, if we do this, we had identified 43 significantly enriched gene families in 10,000 trios. So, which is basically um, strongly enriched. For example, we would only expect 50, it's about C750, because it's a 54 enrichment in these 43 families. Just as a sanity check, we have also data from um, 2,000 trios um, without neural dental disorder. And here we don't see any enrichment if we look at these 43 gene families. So many of you might think now, OK, um, is this signal which we see here now driven by genes uh, which are new, so individually contributing a little bit to the gene family? Or is this signal driven by genes uh, by single genes which are already known and um, basically our um, gene family signal is only dependent on these known disease genes, which might be a true possibility. And indeed, if we look at these families, we see that in, in the most families, um, there is one major contributor of the signal who has the most variants in the family. However, if we remove all um, established disease genes, we still see a five-fold enrichment in our gene family genes, showing that actually there is contribution from other genes which are yet not um, statistically significant in, uh, on individual um, very, uh, gene level. If we then apply a couple of filters, we can basically look at all these genes which carry these de novo variants and which are not yet um, established um, exome-wide significant in genes. We can look for those which are brain expressed and those which are also um, likely to be disease associated because they're intolerant for missions but also function variants in the general population. We end up with this uh, list of genes for which many genes already have molecular support um, to be disease associated. But others are not, and it's interesting to follow this up. Besides the gene discovery um, opportunity due to increased po um, power, um, we can also use the Palo conservation score to visualize um, disease associated um, sites in the protein or, or extremely conserved sites in the protein. Basically, um, what, um, since we have scores for each amino acid, for each um, amino acid sequence, we can, for example, like here shown for the potassium channel encoding gene casing Q2, we can now look at the first amino acid and here's the last amino acid and look how conserved each um, amino acid position is. If it's um, conserved across the family, then we, have, then we assign a positive score. If it's not conserved, then we assign a negative score. And the top score represents amino acids which are fully identical in the whole gene family. And as you can see, our patient missense variants for this gene, which we identified in the 10,000 trios, for, um, for uh, hit sites which are identical in the whole gene family. And as you can, um, in addition, you see that um, our scores correlate with um, some domains, but not with all. So, so actually, some known domains actually are not conserved at all. However, we can even see without, uh, in, within known domains some sites which are more strongly conserved and which help, for example, um, biologists understanding why in particular variants are located at some sites and can prioritize variants for functional testing. As you can see here, a couple other examples. Um, this um, framework allows um, to visualize um, multiple um, um, protein sequences and we have the score for more than 7,000 uh, genes generated. Um, as you have seen before on the slide, that um, individual variants and conservation score are interesting. However, um, you see um, also um, that uh, most of these individual variants, which are strongly conserved, and where also the disease variants are falling in, and they're often located in regions where, uh, where also the surrounding amino acids are parallel conserved. 
And to um, leverage this, we developed um, also um, a framework where we can basically score the average um, power law conservation um, of the five um, adjacent aminoids before and after. I can also tell you that we, at the moment, we do this even in 3D, also we develop this in 3D. So, but in 2D, we can now score the individual variant um, co uh, conservation score, which we're interested in. So low to high, and we can also score the regional um, power law conservation from low to high. And what you can see here, for example, in this um, project where we have a 150 emissions variant in SCN2A, which is associated with neurodermal disorders, you see that all population control variants, especially those which are frequent, really fall into the sites here shown uh, um, in green and with segregation or density. Um, yeah, so each fluid uh, circle represents a variant, are falling into the sites which are not conserved, so or private. Whereas um, the, still the rare variants, also singletons, so those which we only find once in 140,000 individuals, are falling also into the same site but there's a little bit more dispersion. But if we look um, clearly in our patients, um, the, all the variants which are, huge, or the majority of variants which we find here are really um, parallel conserved in terms of individual variant, but especially also the region if you look at the patients with a more um, severe form of the disorder. Overall, I hope I could convince you that um, gene family information is useful to gain power in disease discovery. We could also show for the first time empirically that disease associated missense variants fall into parallel conserved sites, which is a very important notion. And what I didn't show you today is that um, all the observations which we show today can also be replicated across disease. So we have done similar analysis um, for the whole ClinVar data set um, and show similar um, solutions. So our observations are not brain disorder specific. Um, if you're interested in the project, feel free to look at our paper. And um, with uh, further, uh, no further ado, uh, I'd like to thank uh, my mentors and um, I'm happy to receive questions.